consumer products giant Church and Dwight. It has now found itself in the crosshairs of a short seller. Church and Dwight is, of course, the company behind many well-known brands, including Arm & Hammer, Trojan, and OxyClean. Last uh, Thursday, the firm Spruce Point Capital Management issued a 90-plus pages of uh, research questioning Church and Dwight's accounting practices, also its acquisition strategy. News of the report hitting the stock, helping to send shares down about 4% before they saw a bit of a rebound. In the past 12 months, Church and Dwight's stock has risen almost 30 percent. In a statement, uh, the company uh, told CNBC the following. We have confidence in our long-term plan to deliver superior returns based on our uh, evergreen business model and our strong second quarter results demonstrate our continued momentum. This report contains a number of false and misleading statements and is simply an attempt by a short seller to negatively impact Church and, uh, Church and Dwight's share price before its own benefit. Joining us right now on the set is the author of that report. Uh, on Church and Dwight, Ben Axler. He is the founder and CIO of Spruce Point Capital Management. Good morning to you. Good morning. You heard what they had to say. Uh, make the case, and then I have a, a lot of questions about the report that you've issued. Sure. Well, false and misleading points, I'd like them to lay that out, number one. But the case here is very simple. This is a, an iconic company that's used a, a stable brand, Arm & Hammer, to diversify into other brands that over time have really started to underperform. Um, they brought in a new CEO, who's also the chairman, we have some governance concerns along that matter. <clears throat> but now they've gotten more aggressive with their financial acquisition strategy. As we pointed out, some accounting issues, some uh, levers they're pulling to pay themselves bonuses um, for non-cash gains. Um, last year, the gross margins actually went down to a three-year low. You know, they claimed it was a great year, paid employees 15 percent bonuses. Right. Um, the recent acquisitions of the uh, water pick and the flawless hair care we have particular issues with. We think they're going to underperform like many of the past acquisitions under the management team. Let, let me just ask you about your own incentives and incentive structure because people always look at short sellers and say, what is their motivation? Sure. Um, you have shorted this stock. Is just, can you walk us through exactly your own position? Sure. Well, full disclosure, we yeah. are short the stock. Right. We do think there's extreme overvaluation here. So is it, but is this a, an issue for you just of overvaluation in terms of the overall multiple? Because, by the way, it is a high multiple. I don't want to I don't want to discount that sure. issue. That's part of the story. Right? right. So our perfect short is we look for a company that's struggling, that's using aggressive accounting to make the numbers look better. We look for evidence of bad corporate governance. But in this case, as you pointed out, we have extreme overvaluation. Of the 19 analysts that cover the stock, only four are buy, and it's trading above the average analyst price target. Well, let me ask you, what do you think a fair price for this, this stock is? I mean, we could see the stock down 50 percent, right? I mean, it's trading at a 20 times EBITDA multiple. Many of the acquisitions um, they've acquired have been in the 13 or 14 times EBITDA. That's been their long-term historical multiple. So if you believe me that the corporate governance is bad, that the quality of the financials is bad, that they're struggling, why would you pay a premium right. multiple for a company let me like ask you, this? Let me ask you about that struggling, because you look at organic growth in the company. Year-to-date uh, 19 is uh, up 4.7 percent. Uh, it is up 3.6 percent over the past decade. And that would be higher uh, than its average peer, the, the peer group, which was really about 2 percent. So how does that square in your mind in terms of the operational success or, or, or lack of success that, that you've described? It, it would appear to be more successful. So we have two points with that. Number one, the near-term organic growth has been overstated why the company put through some price increases. Those are set to lapse um, coming up next year. So that's not going to be a sustainable source of organic growth. Number two, um, we found evidence of undisclosed acquisitions in some of the company's international units. So we think that those undisclosed acquisitions have actually been used to boost the organic growth. Um, we don't have confidence in the organic growth numbers that they're portraying, nor do we think it's sustainable. And we think that, the, again, getting back to the valuation, the, the market is assigning a, a significant valuation premium for, what, 2%? You know, um, uh, two percent. Uh, you know, increase in but, the organic but, but I growth. Think that, uh, uh, Larry has a comment to make, but I think there's a distinction between saying, "Look, we just think this is an overvalued company based on the multiple, based on the math." That's sure. that's one argument, right? It's another to go with the accounting to claim that the, the company is not operating the way they say they are, uh, to claim that there are governance issues, and so uh, maybe it's a stew or a mix of all of these things. But I, I think that the people are trying to sort of make a distinction between them. Sure. Well, again, I think it's a combination of everything. Plus, you have to look at the leverage here, right? The leverage has gone up under the new CEO. So when you put, put more debt on, you know, low growth to potentially declining growth, um, that, become, that should become a real concern. And 
what kind of safety do investors have here? If you're a Church and Dwight investor, you're getting a 1% dividend yield. Right. If you look at most of the CBG companies, they're paying 2%. We're actually long Clorox, by the way, as a hedge against this. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper. They have more dominant market share in the categories they compete with. You're getting a 2% plus dividend, better governance. Um, that's how we think about this. If people are thinking, well, how do I implement this on a relative value basis? We expect this name to underperform some of the better quality peers. Larry? Well, first of all, a full disclosure, Matt Farrell, who's the CEO, used to work at Allied Signal. So he was a finance person there. So he understands financing. Maybe you don't like the way he understands it, but he does. Secondly, debt goes up when you do acquisitions. They have done a lot of acquisitions, as you point out. Second, thirdly, these acquisitions really haven't had time to determine whether or not they're going to be successful. Yes, they started out quickly. They began to ebb. But I think there's a third leg before we know exactly what happened. So from my standpoint, at least, I think it's a well-performing company. Your peers didn't agree with you in terms of other sh uh, share owners in this. I noticed a lot of people who had different opinions. So uh, I'm wondering why you picked them as a target. Look, I think we picked them because we have real concerns about the financial performance, particularly the recent two deals. They bought a, a water flossing company. They paid a billion dollars. They paid five times what the private equity owners paid for it. They bought a flawless hair care product, which is an as-seen-on-TV product. You can go into Dollar General and find it next to light bulbs for $15. We don't think these brands are buying have real staying power. We think they're going to lose market share. We think they're commodity products with inflationary you know, product segments, and we think they're going to underperform. And now with more debt on top of lower quality acquisitions, we think investors need to be careful about owning this. Let me ask you one other question. You talked uh, about, or in the report, talked about what you think of as a slowing dividend. Um, but it looks like now they've, they've paid, first of all, there's a dividend they've been paying for over a century, but it looks like it increased by about 5% in 2019, which again is higher than, than the peer group. And I'm looking at PG&E and Rickett and some of the others. All, all lower, and so that I'm trying to, I'm trying to square these two sides of the story. Sure. Well, again, you know, a lot of people value stocks, dividend-paying stocks, and a dividend growth model, right? And when the dividend growth rate is coming down, you know, the share valuation should come down. We think the right. multiples should come down. We can't understand why the multiples expanded recently, as it's become more evident that the cash flow is struggling. You know, one other point we have to raise here is the company just increased their their AR factoring facility. That, for us as short sellers, has generally been a, a positive red flag in identifying companies that are struggling. You know, cash conversion cycles going down. Again, undisclosed acquisitions. We're seeing a lot of signs of strain here. And, let's, and, a, and a final point, if I have to yep. make one, is look at what the insiders are doing. They're constantly selling stock. Three directors just sold in the past two weeks at $79, $80 a share. I usually follow what insiders do, and that's a strong signal to me of why I'm short. Final question, have you talked to them? We've not heard from them. You know, our numbers open. If they, you know, they said there's uh, inconsistencies or challenges to some of our points, you know, we're happy to correct them if they can prove us wrong. Okay, maybe we'll uh, we'll set up a lunch. Thank or you. Or maybe <laughs> something here right on Squawk Box. Appreciate it, Ben. Thank you for coming. Thank in. you. Yeah.